My name is Luca Bono. I'm an electrochemical chemist. I have been working in the uh, battery pack and cell packs for the last uh, 12 years. But I started working on lithium ion batteries in the 90s. And uh, it's an extremely interesting ride. And the uh, future is coming, and uh, I am quite happy for that. This uh, afternoon we will talk about battery pack and uh, cells inside the electric vehicles. And uh, this is really, really, really challenging because uh, from first and second generation of electric vehicles that basically the architecture of the vehicle was uh, uh, still coming uh, from an heritage actually from the uh, endothermic engines. Now we see with skateboard platforms uh, and other solutions that the electric vehicle is assuming a quite different structure, a quite different uh, perspective and the challenges are quite interesting. So let me move uh, to the first speaker. Mr. Yves Simon uh, De Sun, Sales and uh, Product Manager of Lithium Battery Equipment, uh, Sovema Group. He will talk about uh, marketable solution for ramp up activities in complete cell to module assembling technology. Um, we observed in Sovema that uh, projects turned customer into natural partners, okay, pushing us equipment manufacturer to implement more automation on each workstation. Um, by workstation I speak each station we need to implement in an assembly line to make a cell. Okay? Um, even for small productivity needs, thus overcoming critical points such as footprint, energy saving, product quality and repeatability, as well as skilled expert shortage. I mean we have some difficulties, I mean all of us here, to retrieve some skilled people to make um, determine, let's say, specific activities. So Sovima Group brings today at ETEC Europe its experience as a key player in assembly, formation, and testing, uh, with a special focus on marketable solution meant to solve common issues. So the clock is ticking. You may have recognized this movie, okay? It's an Independence Day, okay? The clock is ticking. Why? We're here to help, okay? So we all have this common, let's say, um, uh, topic of time. So the clock is still ticking. Um, our customer need to, yes, um, need um, our customer need technology transfer, battery materials, supply chain sourcing, sourcing, recycling, and their customer need batteries. Okay, so we need to partner. We need to partner with many companies to be able to fulfill what we what we receive us in terms of requests. Uh, sorry. So wide variety of applications, wide variety of partners, urging investors and demanding markets express the need for partners like Rochester Institute, okay, uh, Austrian Institute, Hive Electric in France, uh, and big universities for development. So whatever the country, in Germany, in France, in Canada, there's an emergency for technology transfer, but battery materials, um, supply chain sourcing and recycling. So flexibility. Flexibility means you can mix the equipment and choose to go either manual, semi-automatic, automatic, standalone, or automatic inline using. Uh -huh. Wait. So prismatic winding on flat mandrels. This is the, the the square you have on the on, on the left part of the of the picture, or punching plus default or single sheet stacking. You can also choose to go. Lithium metal, let's say, uh, foils, laminate, uh, foil lamination onto copper foil from reels, plus separation and castle separation from reel with final single sheet stacking. So these are complicated machines, but that are able to fulfill what can be done in terms of chemistry. Wait. Lost. Lost, anyway. Uh, then you can go with the same uh, equipment in the second square with pouch assembly comprising cavity forming, tab welding and pouch selling. And we are just focusing here on pouch 
assembly. This is a choice we made because we don't have much time available. Then we go with the final part of the, of the assembly line, which is filling, formation, and degassing, plus testing. So this is how we, let's say, feel to be flexible enough so that the customers can, let's say, choose to go either on cylindrical, prismatic, on pouch, according to the needs and the applications. Non, mais non, le scopio va passer sur la femme positive. Sorry. Non, parce que je me suis mis ici pour pouvoir faire scorer le stand. Non, riche à aller là-bas. Elle devait tourner là-bas, je pense. Non, nous avons le mouse dans l'autre. Ah, reprends la présentation. Non, 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 wait. Il y a le mouse là, vedi. Parce qu'il a voulu, c'est avec les stand. Ah, bravissimo. Reprends la présentation. Mais directement, il devrait être, non, ça ne va pas. Non, c'est pas ça. Ok. Go ahead. Ok. So. Um, flexibility. So we can, as I told, said before, we can go either by winding cells, punching and stacking cells, and we can also go through laser, but if I will invite you to come in, in our booth so that we can explain this technology because it's quite, let's say, uh, controversial, but it's quite interesting because we can reach really interesting results even with laser in terms of burrs and, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, possible problems that can be met by labs and, and OEMs or big battery manufacturers. There are some solutions. So the request for small to jumbo formats are also really challenging. So it, push, it pushes us to ramp up our capabilities. Since today we range from 20 millimeter cell up to 800 millimeter cell. Okay, so this is for power cells and, and let's say, um, and also to meet uh, dur durability, let's say, um, uh, uh, request over time. So, repeatability. So, when you, once you have done some prototypes with very manual or semi-automatic machines, you must be able to repeat your prototypes to show your customers that you're able to do a product that can be let's say, brought into series or brought into, put into parallel to make some modules and packs. So it's important to have semi-automatic and automatic machines that can repeat the system. So this, this uh, video, short video, I hope it's going to work. No. Caricamento in corso, okay. This morning it was not working. Oh, the morning is where we're working. Okay, that's fine. Anyway, you need to be one boy. Ah, okay, quick time non disponible. Mi dispiace, ma non partirà. Okay, anyway, so <laughs> just imagine a very nice machine, okay, <laughs> that will come from a reel and, and, and form some cavities, okay, to make a power cell. Then you will have a pick and place system that will come and pick up the cavity after forming and deposit into into a box and a series of three, four, f up to five boxes. Okay, this is a, ma a machine we recently sold to someone who is also presenting today uh, some, some projects and equipment here in the trade fair. They are for France, I will not name them, just for the NDA we have with them. Uh, very interesting since it gives the possibility to the, to the operators to push the start button and have some buffer time to go and deal with other activities inside the lab. So, um, okay. So the stacking. Oh yes. Oh, maybe this one not working. Quick time non disponibile. Oh shit. Anyway, this this video. Oh, it's not changing. It's not changing. It's not changing. presentazione. Devi tornare su questa diapositiva qua. Ok, so we have here two videos. Ok, so after time, partnering, flexibility, repeatability, we go to accuracy. So we have two technologies we can see. It's a, it should be a video, but it's only a picture. So I will invite who is interested. I mean, to our booth so I can show the video directly. I mean, we have time, we have two days, so it is possible to see everybody, I think. Um, so on, on the left, on the left, let's say, part, we have a winding machine. So we're able to wind some, some cylindrical sets and also work on, on flat mandrels, with flat mandrels to make some, some sandwiches, okay? And we can go uh, also 
and be very flexible and very accurate when we use the single sheet stacking machine or the Z4 stacking machine. And I'll just show you here only one picture, just to try to make you think of what it can, can be in the, in, in, the real, in, the real, in the reality, okay? So we are able, let's say, to go uh, with the same technology and propose for the same lab, the same, let's say, uh, three different types, uh, three different ways to make a cell, to make up a cell, okay? So we can, we are very accurate because we have EPCs, trip separator guiding systems, vision system to ensure al accurate alignment. Um, and we are, let's say, very flexible since we designed the machines to be, to be able, so that the, 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 the customer, the operator, the PhD, is able to proceed autonomously um, um, to the tool changeover. Okay, this is this is very important. So a lab or a starting company making batteries is not, let's say, uh, due to force to use only one type of tool. It can use several types of tool, and it, you only need maybe 30 minutes or one hour to make the full changeover. So to this extent, we've developed a multifunction stacker that is able to work also lithium metal. So clearly working in a, in a dry room. Um, so time partnering, flexibility, repeatability, accuracy, and communication. Uh, the module you see here is made by, by, I have the authorization to speak about them, so it's Hive Electric in France. Uh, very interesting because they have very interesting cooling system, and they are making this from, uh, from cylindrical cells. Okay, this is just to let you know what you can have inside. But clearly, according to applications, you can go either in cylindrical, pouch, in, in prismatic cell. This is, there's no, no, let's say, uh, no lock. I mean, you can decide what you want to do according to application you want to use. And clearly the chemistry uh, is really called to change because we have a clear supply chain problem. Okay, so just to, to say that. So the equipment has the ability, let's say, to communicate over various protocols like CAN, flex ray, and so on. I mean, this is very, very, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, versatile. Okay, so for me, it's just to focus on safety features. Uh, clearly, when you assemble a cell, you need at the end to form it, according most of, often always, let's say, the, the most, uh, let's say, in the vast majority of cases. Uh, we use uh, bi-directional, fully regenerative circuits from 5 amps to 150 amps. So we are able, let's say, to, to treat, let's say, most, um, almost all the cells that are available today on the market. Uh, in, in case of, uh, if, if it's, if it sh should it be, let's say, needed, we can also parallel some circuits to do it. And then we can regenerate the, the energy with its charge from cells onto charging circuits. Okay, that this is the point, and this is also the way we should all think, let's say, and collaborate together and partner, at times even with, with, with competing companies. I mean, it's important to, uh, to bring our competencies together so that we can, let's say, reach a good uh, global result. So clearly the safety is also uh, an important feature because we are able to, to trigger the nitrogen flux inside the chamber if needed. It's able, they say, to detect this is a famous uh, German, let's say, uh, PLC manufacturer doing this for us. So automatic storage retrieval system, this is a system we made in the US several years ago and we are also now newly making. So uh, it's made about, it's, it's about formation, testing, and clearly about automation. So just imagine that once you have produced your trays containing all your cells, the tray is taken inside some formation chambers through a shuttle. The shuttle brings the, the, the tray onto the, into the formation chamber. The formation cycles happen. Then it's automatically removed, brought to aging, brought to testing to be, let's say, finished by the, the battery manufacturer. And all this, let's say, works uh, autonomously and it's made in Italy. I just wanted to say, I'm French, but it's made in Italy, okay? <laughs> so this is just, uh, oh, no, it's not going on. Yes, or is it going on? Yes, I was, I was speaking about something that you were not seeing, but that's fine. No, 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 it's well, the same, same, it's the same. Yeah, yeah. anyway. The goal, the goal is just to see the, they say the list. <laughs> so time, partnering, flexibility, repeatability, accuracy, communication, safety, and testing. And last but not least, I think it should be, yeah. Oh, pop, pop, pop. No, I newly do did something. Reprendi presentazione, Yeah, sempre lui. <laughs> okay, this is what I was speaking about. I mean, the automatic storage retrieval system. Anyway, so. Um, 
Yes, if you need to, to speak with some people in Germany, I would suggest you to speak with uh, Jürgen Pendel, uh, if he's in Austria, uh, with Terry Hartman in the US, with Joe, our colleague from, from, from China, uh, Luca, my, Luca here at the first row, and myself, Yves and Francesco, we are from Italy, and Jean-Baptiste Bonnet is from France. Okay, so we work with labs, we develop technologies, and if you need to be helped, or if you think you can bring us some, some let's say, some positive stuff, I mean, we're here just to learn and to help. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Giacomo Tuveri. I'm the V program manager for EMI in Kisait. And um, this afternoon, I will be talking about how to build a lab for battery, battery testing. Here is the agenda I will go through. So first of all, I will start with our motivation on running this business. Then I will talk about uh, uh, some uh, important relevant facts about the EV market and battery market. And I, then I will jump on the subject, talking about how to develop a battery test. So let's get started. And we talk about our motivation. In a nutshell, basically, Kisait uh, is supporting any kind of individual or company trying to be first in the market. So basically we design and support this approach, we design solution to support this approach, enabling our customer on being first in their marketplace with new products, with new technology. And this is basically what our founders created more than 80 years ago in the HP time. Um, in the, I, I'm part of the group which is taking care about uh, e-mobility uh, concerning the um, powertrain marketplace. So basically, we um, serve all the different uh, um, uh, technologies concerning charging infrastructure uh, across our roads, uh, charging technology on board cars, uh, battery management system testing, cell and uh, battery testing, and last but not least, inverter testing. So we, for each of uh, these uh, different requests, we have a solution to support our customer on developing their own products. And. Uh, Okay, and before to talk about how to build a battery lab, I would like to talk about some very important aspect in the EV and battery uh, market. First of all, the number of registration, which means the number of new electric vehicles we expect to get in the market. Recent forecasts say that uh, we will get more than 50 million cars circulating in our in our roads. That means that uh, this is this by 2030. So that means that uh, in 10 years we will have five more time uh, cars circulating our roads. So we will have a lot of need for new batteries. We will have the need to have a more, uh, let me say, uh, smart grid and uh, even would say a more sustainable uh, grid and uh, charging infrastructure to sustain this kind of business. And if we start talking about uh, the battery uh, request, uh, we'll see um, a forecast for an increase uh, which is 14 times more, more uh, than the, the actual value, the value that we saw in uh, 2018. Uh, this is a very incredible uh, increase if compared, for instance, with the static applications or batteries for uh, consumer. And uh, we know that this means uh, uh, gigafactories popping up uh, in, uh, at worldwide level, but even here in Europe. And so we expect to get uh, up to 25 new gigafactories uh, in Europe, uh, some of them here, here in Italy. So we are expecting one in north of Italy, in Piemonte, another one uh, in south of Italy. And so this is really challenging for customers and, of course, really challenging for, uh, for us. And so it's really important to, to, to start thinking about how to build a battery, battery test lab. And uh, we can start talking about that, uh, talking about the, what, what we call the circle of success. We start uh, talking about uh, customers concerning their specific needs. So we listen to what they would like to achieve with their project. Then we start to design a solution together with our customers. And uh, we, we are even in the position to deploy and uh, commission and install the solution itself. We keep uh, the people inside uh, the different organization always ahead with the, the technologies, with our training services. And we can even release uh, some additional service from very basic one like maintenance 
components for the for the systems up to very complex and tailor made like resident professional engineers working 24/7 with our customers of course we we want to keep always uh, up and running the system with our system calibration services and we can even teach our customer on how to keep uh, the system running uh, by teaching them uh, as i said how to uh, run the calibration last but not very least it's really important to have uh, software which are ahead um, with the with technology so we always offer the possibility to renew the software subscription in order to get updates on a regular regular basis so let's try to to run this kind of journey on building a battery lab and uh, we start talking about uh, the, uh, the, the 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 details the first details, uh, which is basically try to understand which is the device and the test the, the customer is looking to, to, to address, which can be cells, uh, which can be modules, which can be packs, uh, or, or which can be even the three of them all together. This is something we, we see quite common. Then we start defining all the subsystems, which are uh, uh, considered as a side system in, in, in a battery test, but still really important for the for the success of the lab itself and if needed we can even provide what we call third party like chambers or conditioning system or safety system or even the safety concept and of course the last piece which is really important is the software and we have different level of software so we have a basic one connected to the hardware so working at hardware level and in case of specific needs in case of like for instance possibility or need to assess the data from multiple locations, from multiple labs, from multiple devices, we can even provide a software which is based on a cloud approach. Uh, so we have the possibility to streamline the access to data uh, without uh, losing any information with different people accessing from different locations, from different, uh, different devices. Now, once we have assessed what is the device to be tested, of course, it's time to consider even the place dedicated to, to the lab. And we have a different solution. Maybe the basic one is the most common one is an existing building. In this case, uh, the challenge for the customer and so for us is to reallocate the space. So it's about to uh, understand which, has, which is the room needed for in order to run a lab, to allocate the sp space, uh, to allocate all the different resources. And this is taking some time, uh, despite the building itself is really in place, so we can shorten at least the time to market. And then we have to consider after two different possibilities. So we, let's assume assuming the customer already spotted a place where to run the, the, the lab and we can have as I said two possibilities a new building and in this case uh, the challenge is most related to the cost to, to, to build the construction and of course uh, most related to the time needed to build it and, uh, and but on the other side uh, this is something that is built on a purpose so that means that all the spaces are allocated in the proper way uh, no exceptions uh, and no problems should be found in the, um, the final stage. The other possibility is the one we recommend the most is to start uh, testing immediately uh, with a, an approach based on test units. So you can see in the slide a container which is designed for a for a purpose test, which can be uh, cell test or module test or pack test. So the container is, is already equipped. We can deliver it once we find the place. We can connect it to the grid, connect it to the system like water cooling, and the uh, customer can run the test soon after the installation. So this is a very um, smart way to start testing immediately. It's modular, it's extendable, and this is highly, this is highly customized uh, depending customer needs. Then once we have identified the, the location and start to, 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 to fill in the lab with some uh, uh, tester or cyclers and in order to be really smart even in this phase uh, we are now moving all uh, our testers uh, with, in a, with, with a new technology which is based on the silicon carbide which means higher switch in frequency f uh, fewer switch in losses and less uh, heat dissipation and all those aspects are bringing in the game um, new features like better regulation for voltage and current uh, lower energy cost uh, 
due to the high uh, energy efficiency, up to 96%, and of course reduce size of the cooling unit, so smaller footprints, which means basically saving uh, space, saving room, and saving money for our customers. We can even run a simple, simple exercise, so we can take into account three different labs with three different sites based on uh, operating uh, hours per year of 4,000 hours, and we, see, we can see that uh, reducing, increasing the efficiency of the system, we can definitely save money. And uh, the saving can go from 12,000 euros for a small lab, uh, going from 85% efficiency up to 96%, up to 160,000 euros for a very big lab. So again, we are supporting and helping our customer on saving, saving money. Last aspect is not only related to the technology, but even to the installation phase. So we also we thought that was even smart to, to have a different approach here. So besides the mirror design, within the standard design, we have a mirrored design so that uh, our system can be put uh, side by side or back to back. So we have an approach which is basically collecting and putting in the same place the connection point for our cyclers. So that means that water connection and the grid connection can be put in the same location. And so as you can see, racks can be put side by side, side and, and um, back by back. That means that we are even servicing the system on the front, saving again uh, space, which in some cases means saving, uh, saving money. Okay, last but not least, we also decided to, have, to give our customers the possibility to run upgrade on existing systems. So that means that the customer can start with a basic uh, configuration. I would say 1,000 volts, uh, 300 amps, uh, and uh, I don't know, 90 kilowatts. And then we give them the possibility to increase and upgrade the voltage up to 1,500 volts. We give the possibility to increase the current up to 900 amps and, of course, uh, the power up to 270 kilo, uh, kilowatts. And, you know, upgrades are cheaper, upgrades are faster because there is no need to change uh, the configuration, there is no need to purchase additional units to, to be put in parallel in order to increase the power. So really, something really smart, fast, and, uh, and cheap. Again, we are supporting our customer technologies by reducing the cost uh, of operating the, the system. Now, to wrap up, uh, we went through different possibility of saving uh, uh, time, space, and cost. We saw that, si that the silicon carbide technology is helping our customer to save space in the lab as well as cost. We saw that mirror design and front service are helping our customer to save space uh, in, the, in the lab. And uh, we saw that the, up the possibility to make upgrades is definitely saving time because there is no need to wait for a new delivery and of course cost because uh, upgrades are definitely cheaper than new units to be installed in the same lab. And we also saw how to support and, and uh, help our customer on different, in the different aspects and the different moments of a lab uh, um, uh, building. So, we, 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 for instance, we went through all the different, uh, uh, let me say, problematics related to time to test, space, utilization, and investment. And uh, we realized that at the end, basing a lab on test units is maybe the smartest way to start uh, testing soon after the installation while new building is of course time consuming and expensive but at the end the system is made on purpose while the existing uh, building is always challenging and is only challenging our customer on, re on um, how to reallocate uh, the space but the concept I would like to tell you is that uh, whatever is your need what, what, whatever are our customer needs we can definitely support them on being first in the market and of course we are here at DTEC, we, we are uh, on our left at the booth C59, so if you want to join us and to visit us, uh, we, we are more than welcome to, to, to host you. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Giacomo, for handling on time everything and uh, really, really clear presentation.
Thank you. Uh, now I would call to, to, the, to the stage uh, François Balzac. Mm. So the, the presentation will be about a different topic. I will speak about a, a battery uh, design and uh, a nice target which is to get the best battery for the cheapest possible which is not possible by the way so this is one of the conclusions of the presentation uh, and it will be so in English uh, tomorrow we'll give because we have 15 minutes so it's short um, we'll have a, a workshop at 11 in the in the in the hall where we can uh, you can come if you're here and ask better more questions if you have any okay so they told me that if I do this okay then okay so a few words about what who we are. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> um, so we are a French company. Uh, we are basically a, a, a battery maker, uh, manufacturing in France. Uh, so we design uh, custom batteries, and we manufacture uh, those batteries in uh, in France, in the southwest part of France. Our uh, markets of specialty, uh, as you can see on the uh, on the slides, are uh, electric mobility. We started 10 years ago when we founded the company uh, with electric bikes, then electric scooters, uh, electric go karts, and uh, last mile deliveries uh, vehicles. Uh, so all types of a, uh, I would say, light uh, urban electric mobility, uh, for which we built specific custom batteries. And uh, we developed more recently uh, a range of uh, energy storage systems for uh, ohms. Uh, so uh, this is uh, another activity we have. And uh, with, the, with the time, uh, we developed a, uh, a specialty working with probably the European leader of a, um, services of sharing, scooter sharing, uh, first in France, then in Italy, in Milan, and then in Spain. Uh, and so we have probably one of the largest fleets of a, uh, uh, swapping batteries in Europe. So we have a good experience in how to swap, to swap batteries for operating uh, sharing services of a, uh, electric mobility. And basically we do that for scooters, but we do that as well for four-wheel vehicles uh, to retrofit those vehicles to be able to swap batteries even if at the very beginning of the, these, those vehicles were homologated without swappable battery, which is an issue and when you want to, oper to operate without any infrastructure, a recharging infrastructure. Um, characteristic as well is that we are uh, working on closing the loop of the, uh, say, circular economy of batteries. Uh, you may know that the uh, environmental impact and CO2 impact is something very critical for electric vehicles. Uh, you may know as well, we'll see that afterwards, but the European Commission is working on new regulations to be sure that a, an electric vehicle is not more um, impacting the environment than a traditional thermal vehicle. Um, some will say that it depends on the electricity and how it is uh, produced. So, but we take care of this through repairing, reusing, and reconditioning batteries for our customers to extend the life of those batteries. And this is something, I think, critical for, for, for the future of those vehicles. Let's enter into the uh, technical stuff. So, uh, basically, uh, I'm not going to give you an electro chemical uh, course, uh, we have no time and probably no interest for that, uh, just some words about how the battery is built. So we speak, uh, we saw previously uh, electric vehicle, electric car batteries. Here uh, we are going to speak about smaller batteries in the range of say 5-10 kilowatt hour, some, some, sometimes less, uh, whatever the batteries uh, and even for electric cars, uh, inside the batteries you have this type of stuff, uh, this type of cells, uh, either cylindrical, prismatic, or pouch, some say uh, LiPo, uh, but LiPo and pouch is exactly the same. Um, this being said, inside those, uh, those packages, those cells, uh, you basically find two chemistries, two technologies. One is what we call NMC, uh, nickel manganese cobalt. And the second is LFP, uh, lithium uh, iron phosphate uh, in English. 
um, and it's important because uh, depending on your application, you may want to pick one on the other technology uh, without caring so much about the size uh, as far as the electric performance is concerned. And whatever the uh, cells you use, here we took the example, if you go to our booth, you will see this, uh, this, uh, this example. And it's, it's a go-kart battery, high-power go-kart battery. Uh, what you see here is a typical configuration of a battery. Uh, you have cells uh, in the blue, uh, the blue cylinders, uh, connected in series and parallel. You have electronics called BMS uh, for battery management system. Um, you have here, it's very visible because it's separated, it's another uh, board. You have the uh, balancing, something which is important as well to ensure the life of the battery, so uh, cell balancing. Um, you may have, it's not here, but you may have also cooling. Uh, in cars, uh, you, we use the, um, yeah, the, 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 uh, the, the cooling circuit of the car. When you speak about a, a scooter, a, a small city car, uh, you don't have any such a, uh, air conditioning, basically, and so you have to manage differently or to be clever enough to avoid having to cool down the battery because it, it has a cost, it includes and introduces complexity, so this is something that uh, you have to think about. I'm speaking... How many? Okay, ten. Ten minutes still? Okay, good. Um, so, uh, we have no time. Uh, <laughs> Uh, just to say that the best technology today is lithium-ion, uh, to, make, to make it simple. Whatever the technology of lithium-ion, uh, you have heard about lead acid, you have heard about nickel, nickel cadmium, nickel metal hydride, though there are still technologies existing, but uh, for mobility today, uh, it's lithium-ion. And then if you have time, we'll, uh, we can discuss. Two parameters when you think about a battery are the temperature, and what we call the depth of the charge. Uh, when we speak about a certain life of a battery, you always have to think about in which conditions, because it's very dependent on the conditions of operation. Uh, on the left hand side, you see the impact of temperature, uh, with a basic rule which says, when you increase the average temperature of a battery by 10 degrees C, you decrease the life by a factor two. So it shows how important is a, uh, I wouldn't say cooling, but how to think about the impact of uh, temperature on your battery. Uh, and obviously, the, the less you can, uh, you can heat the battery and the better it is, obviously. Uh, on the, the right-hand side, uh, it's not so clear because, well, it's, it's small, but basically keep in mind as well that uh, the life is, uh, is directly dependent on the depth of the charge. So if you do 100% depth of discharge is more detrimental to the life of the battery than when you make 80%, when you make 50%, and it's not linear. Uh, and this is also the message here, is to say, uh, in this example, uh, you have a battery, it's uh, iron phosphate, real applications, we are, you, we are at a uh, 3,000 cycles at 80% um, at depth of discharge, but, so 80%, I divide by two, so instead of moving like this, I, I do like this, uh, uh, off, you will increase the life, not by a factor two, but, but, but a, by, by a factor four. So you, you more than double when you decrease by a factor two the depth of discharge of your battery. So the real life is uh, you never go down to 100%, because 100% means you stop the vehicle. So how much are you going to go? and it has a different impact on the, on the, on the cyclability. Uh, so when you, you say a certain battery has a 3,000 cycles or 1,000 cycles, it doesn't mean so much. Uh, you have always to relate to the temperature and to the depth of discharge. Uh, another key message here, because we can hear, or you can hear the contrary, uh, a good battery is not a good BMS, a good battery management system is not a good electrochemistry, is a mix of two. Uh, you can have an excellent electronics management of your battery. If you put it on a bad chemistry, you will get a poor result, and vice versa. So really th think about keeping those two parameters in parallel and when you make the choice of the battery. Good. Let's go to uh, some practical tricks or guidelines uh, based on experience. Huh? This is our uh, daily business. So. Uh, we know well uh, our customers and the first question they ask. Uh, this is 
probably very basic, but each time, uh, first thing is to say, what is the space I have? It's, uh, it's, yeah, it seems stupid, but sometimes we come to a project and, uh, sorry, but it's too small, there is no space anymore to fix the battery, so and too late, you have to redesign the whole thing. Um, and what is the acceptable weight? Uh, if you think about a uh, removable battery, avoid having a battery of 20 kilograms, for instance, because it's just not adapted to the application. Uh, second message is take care of the battery form factor. We see sometimes some very nice, uh, say, uh, design uh, works, uh, designers works, uh, with the batteries in uh, something like this, you know, and uh, the problem is it doesn't work. So think about from the beginning how the battery, you or your battery supplier, how the battery is going to be built because you have some constraints. Uh, you don't just put poor cells inside a, uh, a box and then you shake and that's the battery. It doesn't work that way. No? So that's important. Second is, uh, perfect is the enemy of good, means that you always, you all, <laughs> want the best uh, autonomy or the best range. Uh, the problem is at the end there is, this is the last message, there is a cost for that. And obviously uh, competition is, is, is strong and you have to find the right trade-off between those performance and especially uh, the size of the battery and the cost of the battery. So think about what's id ideal, what is good, and sometimes you don't know, it's better to go back to a uh, lab to build some mock-ups and to measure how many kilowatt hour do I need for my customer to be happy with that. Uh, and don't imagine something uh, engineering job because at the end it will cost too much, too much or will be too big. Uh, to fix that as well, a possibility is uh, downsizing the battery. Uh, you can think about charging the battery several times a day. It makes the battery smaller. Uh, you can think about uh, charging the battery uh, in uh, less time. So uh, what I call opportunity charging. You have a plug, you plug the battery. And uh, the big advantage of lithium batteries is that you don't need to recharge fully the battery. And it's, uh, it's not... It's not not necessary and it's even detrimental. So partial charging is okay, you do it at quick charge and then you avoid having a big battery but a smaller battery and a cheaper battery as well. Other possibilities are uh, obviously removing the battery and swapping one battery discharged by with a battery charged. It's, this is a thing stupid but sometimes it works very well uh, to have a double battery instead of one with hot swapping possible. And last message is uh, share your pricing targets as soon as possible with the battery supplier. It will avoid everybody to lose time in engineering discussions, uh, nice discussions, but at the end we speak to, of the cost and oop, the, business, uh, the business plan doesn't work anymore. So don't be shy, share this with your supplier as soon as possible. Requirements uh, from the regulatory side same, two minutes. Grazie. Uh, don't over specify. Sometimes you will see that in many of those of your businesses, regulation doesn't exist yet. So you have to imagine something or to pick uh, existing norms, standards from other sectors. Uh, the problem is you, are prob you may do some what I call over specifying which has a cost. So don't over specify, but on the contrary, don't avoid some absolutely necessary standards. So here are some examples. Uh, so I, we have no time for that. Thank you, Luca. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we have some, some standards to, 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 and don't do the contrary of over specifying means doing nothing. And uh, Last slide is about uh, the system sustainability of batteries. Keep in mind that the European Commission and European Parliament have started uh, last of a, uh, less, um, uh, in December last year a very important uh, review of the battery directive, which will have in the coming probably months and then years for sure, big impact on uh, what the battery must comply with from an environmental standpoint regarding carbon footprint declaration, regarding eco-design, 
repairability, removability, reusability, all that kind of things that will be applied from this year and you will see in the coming years. So take this in mind, uh, the future of batteries is not the past projected to the future. Huh? Uh, things are coming very strongly to this. And uh, you have no questions. <laughs> and so, <laughs> we have no time. And so, uh, as I said previously, uh, if you want to discuss more, we'll have a 45 minutes uh, tomorrow to discuss about that, if you have questions, uh, here in the hall. And uh, we have also the booth. I will be there for two days, today and tomorrow. And we can discuss your project if you have any, or even if no project, if you have some questions about batteries, we'll be very happy to answer. Thank you very much. Grazie mille per l'attenzione e a più tardi. Grazie. Grazie mille François. Di niente, di niente. Uh, think about a gentleman that spent half an hour with a nerd in the automotive market. This gentleman. James, your turn. Let me introduce you James Oxley. He is a senior consultant manager of uh, Williams Advanced Engineering and uh, I am quite honored to introduce him because uh, Williams, for sure, Williams Advanced Engineering is one of the companies at the edge of technologies at 360 degrees, okay? So I'm excited to learn something from you today. And he will speak as, with us about the vehicle structure integration of a battery pack. So just give a, an introduction to Williams Advanced Engineering before we get into the, the matter of, of today. So we, we're, a, we're a world leading technology organization and we find ourselves usually on the forefront of some of the most challenging applied engineering programs globally. Um, and we pride ourselves on that. We go out to the market and they're the kind of challenges that we want to go and address. Um, our capabilities cover a wide range of disciplines. Um, you know, our, our, our heritage is in Formula One. And so anything that you can imagine goes into modern day Formula One motorsport, which is energy systems, aerodynamics, and ultimately efficiency, because you want to finish with nothing left, um, are the kind of programs that we go and deliver. So. Uh, yeah, established in 2010, uh, based on the same campus as the Formula One team, and we're 400 and we're actually now 440 employees and growing rapidly. We many open um, opportunities for sort of adventurous engineers, and recently acquired by Fortescue Future Industries, uh, who are seeking to decarbonise the mining industry as well. So, on top of all of the exciting uh, sports car programmes that we're delivering and many other markets, we're now really at the forefront of decarbonizing mining operations as well. So really fascinating time to be in electrification. Uh, lots, of, lots of late nights at the moment, but really exciting stuff. So the question today is, how can the battery system deliver more performance? So we know, we know that technology is accelerating. I think we know very well that the performance of sales is increasing, but actually, how do we make the vehicle more attractive? How do we make the vehicle more efficient and really realize that performance improvement? So firstly, the market is, is not just automotive. So when we talk about battery systems, we're thinking about e-scooters and we're thinking about mining haul trucks and there's a lot of applications in between and you can see those on the screen there, moving from e-bikes, motor, e-motorbikes, Formula E, uh, through to hypercars such as the Lotus Avaya program or the Jaguar CX-75, but also um, electric boats and moving up to off-road vehicles like the Extreme E uh, series and, as I mentioned, mining haul trucks. So how do we deliver that performance advantage and how do we make those cells work for the vehicle? So we talk about a three-stage approach when we're developing next-generation battery systems. So the first point is understanding the next generation of novel cell chemistries that are very quickly emerging into the marketplace, gaining a better understanding of those cells and how we can widen the performance envelope of systems using them, then ultimately making them work at a battery system level. 
So just to give an overview of the of the sell market, okay? So we kind of we know where we are today. Uh, so as as we just discussed on the uh, the previous presentation from 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 Francois, NMC and LFP, you know, that's that's where we are today. But we see as well as sort of enhancing the energy density of those and making a there's a few challenges with that, but you can sort of squeeze in performance from what we have today. We're also starting to see on the anode side uh, lithium metal and then sort of niobium, titanium and chemistries like that coming through, which again have their own challenges from, from a voltage perspective, but will have very specific power applications that they can sort of enable certain technologies to go forward with. Uh, I'll just touch on the design side as well. So again, thinking about cylindrical cells specifically here, I think most automotive systems that we see today are using 2170 or 21700 cells. We've seen Tesla announce the 4680 of Panasonic. The 46 format is going to stick in a big way. There are many other cell manufacturers that are pulling that through. There are many other OEMs that are going to pull that through in differing uh, uh, Z heights. So it's a really interesting format and it will drive us to asking for more from the cells. When you've got a, a bigger metal mass you can put in the system, you can do more with it. And we'll sort of touch on that a bit later. So key barriers. So there's a massive issue of NMC. The more energy that you squeeze into it, of 811s for example, you, you, you're going to get more thermal issues and therefore you need a really strong thermal management system to really manage that delta temperature. Thermal runaway when you have that much increased energy density in a cell is really not going to be a good place to be. Big limitation, you need to think about these things carefully. So with the big prizes of system performance come really big and important engineering decisions and you really got to think about how you deliver them. Um, I'm not going to go into lithium metal too much until the interest of time. Because I think I could probably I could probably do a 45 minute workshop on that as well. So <laughs> I'll sprint through. And I think also just being mindful of working with emerging cells, they move a lot. So when you do think about lithium metal, it's going to be in a pouch to begin with, it moves. And again, you need to think about how you manage that mechanical overhead in a system to actually enable taking that volume energy benefit. So, so better understanding of the cells to widen the performance envelope. So we have a way to try and balance the scales. So we've presented a really bleak picture there, just for a minute, but it's not that bad if you've got the right solutions. So there's design-based solutions and there's software-based solution, solutions. So yes, advanced cooling systems, we're, we're thinking about immersive, we're also thinking about intercell. So with larger cylindrical cells, you're typically going to see venting from the bottom of the cell, which means the typical kind of base cooling approach is probably going to move away from the market as we see it today and therefore we need to look at the ribbon cooling approach and also immersive cooling again you can mitigate a, a thermal event very efficiently it's not for all but it's for some applications and it will work very well uh, and therefore we have to have significant uh, modeling capability doing all of these great applications is very interesting but if we don't have good virtual uh, validation, it becomes very, very expensive before we even build a battery pack. So we'll, we'll touch on that shortly as well. And on the other side of the equation, software and, and control systems become more and more uh, detailed and important. So optimising things like the fast charge so that we don't have significant lithium plating issues and also just managing these very expensive fleets of batteries in the cloud so you can sort of find issues as early as possible and manage them before they, they become either a very nasty event or a very expensive uh, event to, to manage. So there's a, there's a few ways of looking at how you can do that as well. So, so I spoke about uh, thermal simulation. So here's just an example here of moving from a relatively simple propagation rig to understand have you selected the right interface material, what happens if there's a venting event. Moving through to what actually happens in a vehicle, you can see from the, the model in the middle, we're not, we're not thinking about a skateboard pack here, we're thinking about uh, maybe a mid-engine styled uh, battery electric vehicle and mapping out exactly what happens when there's a thermal runaway event. 
again at a, a system a analysis level. And then actually the the image on the right hand side of the screen here, I don't know if it's going to play or not, but it's actually quite boring because all it is is a nail penetration test, but because we've done all of the validation steps correctly, the nail goes into the, the pack, the venting happens exactly where we want it to happen, and it's all over very quickly and there's nothing really to talk about. So I guess that's what good analysis tools look like ultimately, is the physical validation just confirms that everything is as planned. So we think about cell performance and really those building blocks. So we've spoken about the cell roadmap and some of the benefits of some of the upcoming technologies. Pack topology, important element, thermal performance, we've just touched on briefly there. And then finally we want to look at structural performance. But the important thing is, is as you build out from the cell, is that you don't make it a compartmentalized thing. You should always be thinking about the structure pushing into the cell and the cell back out to the structure and this should be one uh, you know, collective effort. Otherwise you just end up with parasitic mass all over the vehicle and the end product is not very competitive. And we've, we've thought about that a bit here. So we, we have a lot of partners that uh, we're very happy to work with, but understandably they, the confidentiality is very important to them. And so therefore we, we pulled together our EVX uh, case study to talk around our, our platform know-how and our approach to EV platforms. Um, we've actually worked in collaboration with Vital Design on this. So we provide the platform and we work with Vital Design to apply that top hat so we can actually turn key a whole vehicle program. Um, but you can see here, you can see where the battery pack in this scenario would sit in a skateboard format. But, uh, but the door's open there. We can look at the cell to pack topology. You can start to see some hints around how you can mount certain vehicle systems on top of that battery enclosure. There's potential to make that mass work a lot harder. You've got a lot of metal there with cylindrical cells. So as long as you design that enclosure in the right way, you can actually really get a lot of performance out of that system for, for the vehicle structure. Um, I think there's some good information about this on the internet on how to talk to people afterwards about some of the details of the platform, but I'm keen to try and get Luca back on track. So I'll, I'll finish with just two more slides. Just another view of an ultra high performance EV here. So skateboards are really great for a lot of EV um, applications, but if you still want a truly dynamic driving performance, there will always be a need to still mount the battery pack where maybe you'd have the engine in the fuel tank historically. So we have a, a solution around that too, and we can build that into a, a similar platform approach for low volumes. We have a carbon tub architecture that we can stretch out, so we have a way to, to help accelerate the adoption of that in the uh, hypercar market also. And again, it's, it's about holistically looking at all those systems working together. Uh, and hopefully that comes out here as well. So to include, you know, I think we, we all know the drive to electrification is growing. You wouldn't have filled a room like this probably 10 years ago thinking about electrification. So we know there's lots of new and exciting challenges for OEMs, but we, we must look at the whole vehicle, otherwise we're not going to develop best-in-class solutions. So we really need to make sure whether you're an OEM or a Tier 1 working on these large programs, you've got to pull the vehicle team in and you've got to do this as a collective, if you do it in tranches, you will not have the best in class vehicle, I can guarantee that. But thanks very much for your attention. Cheers. Welcome this afternoon. Thanks uh, for having me and apologies for not being there. Uh, even though we are at the tail end of COVID, we still had trouble to travel uh, this week. So apologies for that. I would have been, um, uh, would, would have preferred to be in Lutbolen with you together. Um, but um, anyway, so I'll, I'll talk uh, about uh, a little bit uh, about, uh, uh, I have the pleasure to talk about uh, multi-material uh, battery enclosures. My name is Roman Hillemeyer. Um, I am the transportation uh, market sector leader uh, at Struck Team, essentially looking after uh, automotive. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned, I have, I have the pleasure to talk about multi-material uh, battery enclosures, what advantages they may bring um, in the uh, uh, the battery um, application and what disadvantage they may bring versus the you know current um, most presented or most used metallic solutions. 
We are um, a composite engineering uh, service company. So we help our clients to uh, develop um, lightweight uh, structures in various um, market sectors, um, automotive and um, wind energy, uh, the biggest ones. Uh, we are come a, have a strong heritage from um, um, designing and analyzing um, structures. So um, we have a team about of uh, 20 engineers uh, located primarily in uh, the south of England, but we have uh, we are located in uh, three other countries in Switzerland and Germany and France. We have engineers located there closer to the end markets. Um, of this team of 20, we are uh, there's a, there's a good uh, range of uh, structural and design engineers, but we have a very large group actually of material science uh, scientists and chemists. Uh, hence, we have a very strong know-how in material and uh, material properties and material developments. And uh, typically, we uh, that in, in, in includes our service to help clients to select materials, sometimes to develop the final solution, and of course, with manufacturing aspects. Uh, the electric um, battery enclosure um, is a large component, as everybody know. Uh, we talked today at this uh, show primarily about the pack, um, but we talk about the you know, enclosure that is uh, surrounding the, the entire pack or as part of the pack. Um, so they have pretty heavy weight, so it's between 70 and quite about 120, 100, up to, all the way up to 150 kilograms is a typical weight representation of those enclosures. Um, there are uh, quite a few challenges uh, with those. Um, there's um, uh, many involving uh, requirements. Um, the battery cell chemistry technologies continue to evolve. And that makes actually the design and development process for the entire industry not easy. You know, everything is still in the move, even though you know, those things are not brand new, but uh, it just shows you how important that industry and how important it is to, to do further improvements in that area. Um, you know, from our point of view, the main development needs are you know, essentially to de develop a safer, uh, to improve safety uh, of the battery systems uh, whilst reducing cost and weight. So those are for, for us the three main areas um, that are key to uh, battery enclosures and battery systems and electric vehicles today. Um, uh, Structium has been involved in, in that application for quite some time. Since about 2020, we have uh, been you know, involved in uh, you know, several um, essentially uh, concept studies. And the target of those concept studies with clients is typically to develop uh, concepts to reach an optimum of safety at uh, a certain level of cost and weight for a target platform. So these are, those, those are it would represent a typical um, uh, a target of such a study. Uh, you know, the advantage for us has been that we've been really you know, at the forefront of understanding uh, what it takes to do multi material design effectively and what is the advantage or disadvantage versus uh, the incumbent uh, metal solutions of, uh, which are used today from it in the market. Uh, we continue to um, support those uh, studies, uh, helping you know, players in the market to understand where is their value proposition, where is their competitive niche. So we we'll continue to support that to clients uh, across, uh, you know, various uh, uh, industries. Um, uh, whilst we do that, actually, we are starting to um, the, put in place new development programs, whereas actually we go beyond the concept, we may go into vehicle um, uh, applications or, or platforms, or we may uh, develop a new prototype. So there's several of those development programs are in the planning phase. So we are um, happy um, you know, to welcome new partners, additional partners uh, to those activities, uh, as uh, this may help you and uh, you know, the, the joining uh, party uh, to understand uh, that market better and see if there's a, uh, maybe a competitive uh, niche that can uh, be developed. Um, so those I'm planning and uh, well, you're also welcome to contact us uh, if you're interested in that. Um, when we do those concept studies um, that I mentioned earlier, uh, we usually need to look at uh, what's out there, what are the benchmarks industry uh, what are you know, relevant benchmarks for the targeted application for the targeted vehicle segment we are after? And this uh, particular case here that I 
talk about here today. Uh, we are um, selected a very actually well-developed um, metal uh, enclosure. It's, it's, it's one of the lightest in the market. It's one of the you know, least costly, most efficiently manufactured uh, enclosure in the market. Um, it's not using, um, just to take that up front, so it's not using um, cells that are structurally loaded. So it's not usually the, you know, some of the other designs you may have heard of, uh, it's not using that. So it, it, um, it gets its uh, weight and, uh, and overall efficiency through traditional um, engineering matter that has been applied so far. Look in that particular uh, concept study we performed, we, we kind of went two directions. Um, uh, principal directions. So we were interested to develop uh, a so-called non-structural enclosure and a structural enclosure. The non-structural enclosure essentially representing an enclosure where we try to minimize the conduction uh, of the primary load. So think about it, it's part of the vehicle, but if it's not in the vehicle, it really doesn't matter to the vehicle. It doesn't really change the performance of the vehicle. It's only there to protect the batteries uh, and the passengers from the danger of that is so being a, a pure safety component. So think about it, the, the plug-in component in a vehicle that can be easily changed. The uh, OEM can do the body and white design, the chassis design, pretty much all it's just giving space for uh, the battery enclosure to design it to make, to make this. Um, the second concept was the structure enclosure, which is kind of the you know, extreme opposite versus the first. So here we are interested to greatly contribute to the body and white rigidity uh, and chassis performance. Performance. Um, we are, um, you know, very actively participating in managing uh, crash events. So it's it has to be fully, you know, designed together essentially with the surrounding vehicle. So it's the other extreme. Um, however, in both uh, concepts, we are targeting we're targeting ease of manufacturing at lowest co possible cost uh, in a in a in a in a multi-material design. So that was the objective. Not really necessary to go the the lowest rate. Uh, interesting and, and the concept that we developed in this particular work actually they offered an integrated underbody shield protection. So for some vehicles, you know, you need increased underbody shield protection, such as SUV, that could be integrated and not be a separate part of the enclosure into this particular design that was the resulting of that study. Um, yeah, just uh, kind of sum up key design features um, uh, that we kind of considered here uh, in this application. Um, we, you know, I mentioned a few of those on the left side, the list of the benchmark in the middle on the right, uh, the non-structural and the structural uh, designs. Um, you know, what was uh, unique, um, you know, versus, you know, was that uh, essentially on the non, you know, the, on the multi-material designs, so the right two ones, uh, we have a, an excellent thermal insulation, um, both on the upper and the lower side. Um, you know, giving it uh, some additional advantage to the other advantages that are shown here and that I mentioned up before. Uh, we have also, um, um, you know, meet, trying to, uh, aiming to meet the most stringent fire standards, you know, that they are just coming uh, to the market right now. Um, and um, um, they're both uh, of those enclosures can be, or are equipped with a modular um, a crush absorbent structure, depending on the vehicle class that can be then adopted. Um, and, you know, depending how much uh, of the surrounding structure, you know, is managing crush and crash, uh, this can be adjusted. So let's take a quick look at the, um, the results of this uh, kind of benchmark study or this first study. And we call this here uh, simply for simplicity, a swap design. Um, yeah, the, um, uh, where we look at, the, you know, various aspects, we look at the, uh, the weight of um, the enclosure, assuming just a nominal weight of 100 kilograms of the benchmark or 100 something, uh, you know, the benchmark. And uh, then actually the battery space and what space in this um, given battery enclosure, which has, by the way, the same outer dimension of the benchmark. So meaning uh, we're not occupying more space. So there's, there's uh, it's really a one-to-one -one comparison. Um, and uh, so looking at that, is, can we increase uh, the packaging in that uh, better enclosure? So that's an important factor and of course cost. Um, so do you see in the non-structure, we're able to achieve uh, a slight improvement, a five, about a 5% improvement in battery space. I mean, you can add 5% of capacity, which is already quite substantial uh, in this kind of enclosure um, as it was already tightly packed. 
uh, we were able to boost about 10% um, of weight um, going to the design. Again, uh, emphasizing the target was cost. And as you see, we were able to reduce the cost substantial. Moving to a multi-material design because um, we used really the materials where they made most sense. Um, and we tried, we came up with very integrated structures with which require very little assembly steps uh, versus uh, the, the quite uh, complicated to be assembled uh, benchmark. Um, the uh, more structural one where you know, there was additional torsional um, uh, reinforcements on body and white was achieved. So uh, we've taken that account in the, in the total weight savings equation. So here we, we achieved close to 20 kilograms of weight savings, again, at a lower cost. The target was here, as mentioned, getting to a lower cost to the uh, combat counterpart, not necessarily weight. Uh, the space uh, stayed the same. You see below kind of the material breakups, very rough, but you see what is you know, apparent that um, in the multi-material solution, we used a relatively high degree of uh, fiber reinforced plastic, so composites, if you wish. And those uh, in combination with uh, several other materials uh, that were also used um, into the, you know, in, in the metal um, uh, benchmark compared to that. So interesting result, we found that this, uh, we were surprised that we were able to, to, to get into the cost, uh, interesting cost range. So then we wanted to take, uh, go a step further. What is actually the total potential um, of, uh, you know, this technology? What if we would, you know, drive this multi-material aspects um, to a maximum the same with if we try to integrate even more functions um, into the bed enclosure, what effect would that have on the closure? We have also, I think, very relevant to the session here, we've, you know, we have looked at the feasibility of a structural cell to pack arrangement. So some people may, may if you heard of that already, that's used in some, some cases already or will be used. Uh, we have uh, considered only today that those cell to pack technologies are only supporting secondary rollouts. So not really changing the driving or vehicle performance, but they are there for secondary loads. So something like uh, actually, you know, when there's a thermal runaway, those help actually to support the structure as an example. Yeah, we see actually um, that the structural designs here over on the graph, um, they provide the highest uh, weight savings, particularly when a high degree of structural integration uh, with the surrounding structure as realized that we maximized that we've also integrated underbody shield functions um, into those ones and you know we, could, we were able to achieve up to 50 kilograms uh, weight savings uh, also combined with alternative materials um, when compared to the more you know conventional swap design which we showed in the slide, the slide before but you also see especially on the non-structural enclosure here on the left side which comes on the left side that it's just going to um, sell to pack arrangement uh, that is structural, you know, there are some weight gains uh, that can be done. Uh, you know, I would say, you know, quite easy, uh, quite easy weight gains and quite substantial, uh, which, uh, which was a, a, a positive surprise to us. Um, yeah, and everything else I think I mentioned, I can jump to the conclusions of my short presentation. Yeah, interesting. We have, uh, you know, the multi-material design, designs can help reducing weight and cost, uh, especially when a high degree of functional integration is achieved. Um, the evolving technologies and architectures are excellent uh, opportunities uh, to uh, introduce uh, improved um, uh, solutions to the market. So I think the time is really not better. It couldn't be better uh, in that market to, uh, to um, investigate and develop a uh, and new solutions to them in the market that help you to differ, differentiate yourself from from uh, from other products that are out there. And with that, I would like to say thank you. I'm happy to take questions, uh, you know, after this uh, presentation or after the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roman. To be perfectly on time, and uh, if you can be connected for a few minutes more in case of some question. Yes. Okay. Uh, is there any question from the audience for uh, Francois and for Roman? I have a question for Roman. Okay. Can I? Yes, use this. Yeah. yeah th thank you for, for the presentation. Um, I had a question about the recyclability of materials, and especially FRP material, which are said to be not as recyclable as aluminum. 
Hmm. Is this an issue? Is this something, uh, well, what's the position? Hmm. No, it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, we, we always do that and, and it's part of time that you talk about. Usually um, this is always, uh, it, it, it's a must today that you provide uh, in answers, answers and, and, and solutions to uh, that matter. Um, uh, fiber reinforced plastics, um, you know, th there's a large array of uh, materials out there and there's, uh, you know, th there's already solutions today that they recycled. So typically uh, what we are trying to do, we're trying to understand what is exactly the need. Um, is it, uh, is it end of life considerations? Is it, is it you know, uh, CO2? emission um, uh, total balances that are uh, required or is it uh, are recycling aspects we need to look at. And usually, you know, there's almost solution for all of them. Um, and we provide those to our clients. So uh, essentially, you know, being in, in a composite engineering, in a consultant, we're kind of got used to, um, to about 50% of those, <laughs> those tasks today. <laughs> so, so it's very common to us to, 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 to to work with the clients on, on, on addressing that and answering those uh, questions that, 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 that are there. But it's, uh, it needs to be addressed, and, but it's addressable. Thank you very much, Roman. I really appreciate uh, your, uh, your speech.